after the fact. So the broadcast is recording live now. Um, okay. And it's 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 being broadcast live, but it's not public. So I don't think anybody's going to be watching it. But if somebody happens to stumble in, that'll be fine. OK, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and mute us. And then when you uh, make the introduction, I'll unmute it. Sounds good. All right, editor, we're going to begin a conversation on ANSI standards in three, two, one. Welcome, everybody. Dustin Harris hanging out with you. Another Appraiser Coach podcast. Uh, hanging out at home today. Uh, got a little uh, different background for you, but uh, grateful to have you on board. Uh, got a couple of great, great uh, guests here today. want to first remind you, we, of course, are sponsored by uh, three great companies. Alamode. Alamode, of course, is the appraiser software that I have been using for over two decades. You should be as well. Uh, if nothing else, it's the uh, company you want to be with for the mobile appraising. Check them out. Go to alamode.com or 800 alamode for more information. Uh, of course, I'm using Data Master on a regular basis to save me 30 to 60 minutes per report. You can be and should be as well. Go to datamasterusa.com. One more time, it's datamasterusa.com. And uh, finally, we are sponsored by OREP Insurance. OREP, of course, is the ENO that I use. Uh, saves me money, gives me benefits. It will you as well. Go to OREP.org. That's O-R-E-P.org for more information. Well, folks, we've got a really special show for you today. Uh, got a couple of great friends uh, on the program with me, and uh, we're doing this in combination uh, with the uh, Appraiser eLearning uh, group. If you don't know much about uh, Appraiser eLearning, you need to find out. Uh, it's a great group group of, uh, of people helping to educate appraisers across the nation. Uh, so that's why I think it's a, it's a great partnership to uh, come together today. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're shooting for kind of the same uh, similar uh, type of thing. Uh, uh, helping appraiser to become more educated and uh, be more successful at what they do. Um, been on the program before, Mr. John Dingman. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for having us. Well, that's great to have you, my friend. Uh, John, uh, of course, is originally licensed as an appraiser in uh, Arizona uh, and uh, was also a registered uh, tax agent. He's now registered in 10 states. He is the chief appraiser at Landmark Nation, uh, Network, a uh, national uh, appraiser management company in AMC. He serves as the president of the National Association of Appraisers. John has assisted in the development of continued education courses uh, approved by the Arizona and California uh, boards and uh, has also instructed uh, appraisers, assessors, mortgage loan originations, um, and uh, the real estate sales classes. He's a home measurement specialist, which will uh, come into uh, play today. He also teaches classes on home measurement. Uh, with him is Mr. Hal Humphreys. Hal is with Appraiser eLearning. He's a lifelong learner and educator. He is practicing a uh, certified fraud examiner. Wow, Hal. And uh, professional investigator. Hal is a CDEI, certified instructor through IDECC. He writes, lectures, and he walks. He's also a certified general real estate appraiser in the state of Tennessee. Hal, welcome to the program, friend. Thank you so much, Dustin. Happy, I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great to have both of you on. Uh, I reached out to uh, to John here recently. Uh, frankly, John, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I reached out to the internet and I said, uh, you know, I get questions every once in a while from appraisers, my friends across the nation who who ask questions about measurement. And I think a lot of appraisers, they kind of pin themselves, if you will, to this, uh, this ANSI standard. Uh, at least when you ask them, well, how do you measure? How do you come up with, uh, with what you uh, uh, sketch on site? Uh, most people would quote ANSI. Um, and then there's questions that come, you know, about ANSI, uh, how to measure this, how to do this. And frankly, John, I'm, I'm not all that, uh, um, uh, educated as you are. Uh, I, I ain't, I ain't educated friend. Um, so I, uh, I had a lot of people reach out to me and say, you know, you really need to get John on the uh, program and I'm glad that you brought a good friend Hal with you. So again, welcome both of you to the program. Uh, we're going to talk ANSI standards today. How's that sound? Perfect. That sounds great. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit. Let's just set the stage. If you guys don't mind. Um, first of all, if there's uh, someone out there listening and uh, they, they might be asking the question, what does he keep saying? ANSI? What, what? ANSI? Uh, we're talking a, an abbreviation here, uh, an acronym, A-N-S-I. Uh, how, what does that stand for? ANSI stands for the American National Standards Institute. Um, and they basically set the standards for measurement and other things. Uh, John? Yeah, res I mean, residential measurement standards, and, and that is the, uh, the version that most appraisers would find online. And they should be referring to the 2013 version as opposed to the 2003. Okay, so 2013, as of this recording, is the most recent version then? That is, that is true. Okay. Why should uh, appraisers care? Is this the only standard out there? It's not the only standard, um, Dustin, uh, and 
I can answer some other questions, uh, I think, later on. But there is the American uh, Measurement Standard, AMS. Um, there is also, believe it or not, uh, the International Property Measurement Standards, or IPMS. And that is, uh, you can find RICS, um, BOMA, even AI, and the Appraisal Foundation are sponsors, um, or at least serve on their board of trustees. And that is an international uh, measurement standard that they're trying to create. And okay, there's, so there, there's also, um, it, I come from a commercial uh, uh, appraisal background, and the BOMA standard and the IREM standard IREM are both um, standards that, that people in the commercial world use, but we we deal now mostly with residential appraisers. And I think the thing to point out is it's good to have a standard so that everybody's singing off the same sheet of music. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. So let's talk that. Uh, let's talk about standards for just a second. If you've got all of these standards out there, why why uh, ANSI? Why, why ANSI? Um, you know, honestly, uh, I've been asked that question before, Dustin, and from an appraiser's approach and, and having served with uh, state coalitions, um, we copy off one another most of the time, right? Um, sure. AMC legislation, for example, from state to state is really a copy from one to the other. The state of Kentucky, uh, they actually require ANSI to be followed by their residential appraisers. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. That was a question I was going to ask is, 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 are they the only state that actually has a, a standard that's required? Do you For know? appraisers statutory, you know, within their statutes, then yes. As far as I, I know, there are some other rules. North Carolina, for example, requires their uh, real estate agents um, to know how to measure. Um, as a result, you can imagine the real estate agents aren't the ones doing it. So they hire an appraiser uh, to, to perform that service for them. Okay, so let's let's talk then. Uh, if it's not required in uh, what forty nine states, um, why why go with ANSI over something else? Well, like I said, Dustin, I think if if the states are going to copy and the regulators certainly, I just gave a speech in the fall at the Aero Conference. Um, should home measurement uh, be regulated, there is consideration for it, um, like the E and O carriers who cite measurement errors is their number one issue. Mm. Uh, regulators uh, seem to find uh, the same issue uh, coming up with complaints. And so as they consider adopting, my guess is the state regulators will probably look to Kentucky statute and, and really a copy and paste. And so that's why I believe ANSI will ultimately be the standard. Um, because again, they're just going to use language from one statute and, and put it in place for another. Dustin, I think um, one of the things that I I talk about a lot, and uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a certified fraud examiner and I'm also uh, a licensed private investigator. So I do some work for the state of Tennessee when complaints are filed against appraisers. Um, it it strikes me that appraisers take on a lot of liability when they take on an assignment. Um, and I don't know what the standard fee for a residential appraisal is, John. Um, it's, it's whatever they, whatever they ask for. It depends. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, if you, if you say $450 to do residential appraisal, you take on a lot of liability when you do that. Um, and the first thing that a lot of people do is they do the research, they go to the property and they, they measure the house. Um, you want to be able to say, here's how I got my measurements. Here's why I did it that way. And, you know, just have a standard that you can go to. So that again, everybody's singing off the same sheet of music. Um, it limits the liability a little bit. If you have a standard and you can go back and say, here's, here's the learned text from which I learned how to do this. And I did it based on this standard that stands up better than, you know, my dad was an appraiser and he taught me how to measure it this way and this is how I do it. Right, right. So let's let's go to liability for just a second. And and by the way, uh, again, I want to want to make sure we set the stage here. The genesis for this program today, uh, for this discussion, really comes from several questions, and they're I would call them frequently asked questions. Uh, questions that are coming in from appraisers across the nation, being asked online, being asked directly to me. Uh, and I'm yeah, let's let's face it, I'm just a, a schmuck with a microphone. I, I'm I'm no expert. That's why I surround myself with good people who know what what they're talking about. 
Um, so I'd like to go to some of those questions. And, and Hal, you talked about liability. Uh, one of the questions that came in uh, from from appraisers was that on liability, saying if we quote ANSI and then don't necessarily follow it to the T, doesn't that open us up for more liability? I think if you if you stick to the standard and you do things the way that ANSI says to do them, um, you're going to be safer than just coming up with a number. Um, you know, my father was a real estate appraiser. I grew up measuring houses. A lot of people in this business came into it the same way. Um, my dad had a way that he measured houses. He was an insurance adjuster before, so he had kind of a, a method of measuring houses. I would hate to be on the stand and have someone say, you know, how did you come up with this measurement? Uh, and just say, well, my dad taught me back in the day how to do this. And that's, that's what we do. Um, I would much that rather be like a pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good argument, right? I would, I would much <laughs> rather. I said so. Yeah, my dad told me to do it. Um, I'd much rather say, you know, here's here's the book that I use. It's a standard that's nationally recognized, and I followed this to the best of my ability. I think that's a a, a safer way to play it. Adherence uh, is important as well, Dustin. Absolutely. Oh sure, sure, sure. So from your perspective, John, uh, you you look at the regulation side of uh, of uh, appraisers appraisals rather. Um, are you finding that that appraisers are following a standard, or do you think it's all over the board, or is there even even any description in the appraisal as to where the measurements came from? Um, you know, it's interesting. There's a slide in a survey that Hamp Thomas, who wrote the uh, the courses for home measurement specialist um, certification, and the survey surveyed, I think, around 200 appraisers and 173, something like that, said they adhered to ANSI. They referenced ANSI or maybe they didn't, um, but they definitely used it. And yet every single one of them answered no to a series of questions. And those questions were, do you have a copy of ANSI? Have you ever read a <laughs> copy of ANSI? Do you cite right. it as your source and do you use it and adhere to it every time? Um, so there's a lot of appraisers saying they do it. When I teach the course, Dustin, one of the things that's interesting to me, and even from my own perspective, I will tell you, I thought I knew ANSI. I thought I knew it pretty well just from reading it. Um, once I took the courses to become the home measurement specialist, I realized that I was doing some things different and maybe following a slightly different standard. Uh, you know, we can learn from those mistakes and move forward. Um, but I think that, you know, when I'm teaching the class, I hear that a lot from appraisers. Oh, I thought I was doing it right, hmm. except for I wasn't doing it right here or right there. Right, right. Okay, good. Yeah, it's it's hard to know the standard if you haven't read the standard. Hal, you talked about singing off the uh, same page of music. One of the questions has to do with the fact that, okay, sure, we're appraisers and we use information that comes uh, usually from the MLS on our comparable sales. Um, and, and then the concern is, well, if an appraiser is using one standard, but the realtor or real estate agent doesn't use that standard, um, we're not singing off the same page of music when it comes to our comparisons, right? That's absolutely right. And I've, I've, I've heard several people, um, you know, very intelligent people that are, are uh, speakers in this industry that, that have strong opinions on this issue. Um, I mean, very, <laughs> if you Wait want an opinion, ask appraisers an, that have strong opinions. I know. Right. Um, you know, the, the tax assessor, I know in Davidson County, they don't measure houses anymore. They use aerial photography to kind of get an estimate of the size of the house. Um, for my house, in a, as an example, um, you know, they've got the square footage wrong. I'm not complaining about it. Uh, they're not hurting me with their square footage being wrong, but it's not right. It's just not the, it's not an accurate, uh, depiction. Um, there are a couple things to think about. Number one, as appraisers, I think part of our job is to reflect what the market is doing. So in those terms, if, if agents are selling houses based on, you know, uh, bedrooms and baths, then we should approach the assignment with the attitude of bedrooms and baths. But if appraisers or if, if real estate agents are selling homes based on square footage value, then we as appraisers have to approach it from the same uh, angle. Um, I think a lot of real estate agents these days hire appraisers to come out and measure the house uh, before they list it so they can have an accurate uh, square footage estimate. Um, I think that's where it's going. Uh, and, and I live in this, this strange little world of Nashville, Tennessee, which 
I think last year we had 100 people per day moving into the town. So the market oh is word. crazy. Yeah, it's insane. We had 36,000 people move into town last year. So it's insane as far as the market activity. There's a lot of stuff selling, prices are going up. Um, but people are paying attention to the square footage issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as appraisers, it, it behooves us to you know talk about this in an idea of what's what's a way we can all do it the same way. Yeah. Um, so and and again, I, you're right. If if um, the assessor's number is being used or the MLS number is being used, and there's no support for that, then you know somebody's somebody's using the wrong number. And I guarantee you, somebody's going to get in trouble over it. At some point, somebody's got to get it right, Dustin. So. Um, it's interesting if you talk to the assessors across the country, the numbers that they use for their mass appraisals and for taxation, uh, they've never intended for any of the market participants, whether those are sales agents, uh, mortgage loan originators or appraisers to rely on those numbers. Mm. And what's really interesting is, you know, we, if you remember when collateral underwriter came out, right? I mean, this is a world of standardization that we live in, whether we like it or not. And Fannie Mae cited no, something like 27. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Fannie Mae cited something like 27 different permutations of average, right? Mm, uh, exactly. We found over 100 different uh, terms used for square footage amongst assessors across the country. Mm. And the, the other thing to remember about assessors, and this is, this is, I know you know this and John knows this, but maybe some of your listeners don't, um, tax assessors aren't required to be right. They're required to be fair. <laughs> I'm just going to let that hang. Uh, John, I uh, had an experience here recently where I went to a project where um, uh, we're talking model homes. Really, they were, they were condos, um, pretty standard. And uh, I did my measurement and um, came up with one number. Let's call it 760 square feet. Um, went back and started pulling comparables from that same neighborhood, uh, if you will, same project, same building. Uh, and they're all coming in at, uh, at 780. Uh, it's twenty dollars, uh, or excuse me, a twenty square foot difference, um, and I know. And I, well, let, let me back up. I don't know I'm right, but I feel pretty confident in my uh, in my uh, measurement. What has happened is somebody somewhere measured it at seven eighty using whatever standard they have, if there was one at all, put that on the MLS or put that on the county records and it was replicated and replicated over because they all said, well, they're all the same, right? Um, an appraiser comes in. He might use ANSI, he might not, but but uh, his measurements, her measurements come up differently than what the county is reporting, what the realtor is reporting, where they're all standard. What do you do? You've got a difference in square footage, but you really don't. You have a difference in standard. So if I'm hearing you correctly, and, and we can talk about even stairs later, Dustin, I, I know that's one of the questions that keeps coming up, but yeah. you know, condos, for example, that's a great example. You never know what they're how they're measuring. Are they measuring to the exterior walls? Um, are they, are they including outdoor space like balconies or, or patios? Cause they often do, um, remember that their approach may be different and it may be income based. Um, the, the reality is you found a 20 square foot difference. If you're confident their model matches, I'm pretty sure you can make an extraordinary assumption or assumption on that for that matter, yeah. that all model, all of the models are matching. And right. therefore, you're not making any adjustment for those differences. Yeah, or and that's what we did. If you, you know, if you're, if you were making uh, adjustments based on a difference, let's say 100 square feet, I don't know what the number is for you, 10 percent, something like that. Um, maybe you extend that to 120 square foot difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me uh, let me share with you another uh, experience that I had years ago with a realtor. Uh, we had uh, gone out to do a purchase, and uh, at the time, I had a trainee actually uh, measure the home, and uh, I don't remember the numbers, but he came up with say 1,200 square foot on this home, and we started pulling comps, and it was very very obvious that the purchase price was way above where it needed to be, and uh, so we you know we went back and forth, and uh, um, basically. Basically, the, uh, the agent got just livid, uh, saying that that home was actually 1,600 square feet. Uh, I remember it was a three or 400 square foot difference. It was, it was a big deal. And in real estate, size matters. It really does. And uh, so I personally went back out and I remeasured it. And guess what? 
I trained my trainee well, folks. He did a, he did a great job. He was spot on as far as his uh, his measurements go. Uh, went back to the realtor, said, "No, here's the problem. You've priced this thing. You've set a a, a potential list price based on sixteen hundred square feet, and the house is twelve hundred. Therefore, we can't compare it to sixteen hundred square foot comps. It's a twelve hundred square foot home." Uh, actually, had the realtor meet me on site. Uh, we measured together. This wasn't a matter of different standards, but this was a matter of uh, pride, really. Uh, even though he could see what was on my laser measuring device, he starts to challenge the laser measure. <laughs> so we pulled out the we pulled out the hundred foot tape, and guess what? It still came out with twelve hundred square feet. the The man threw up his arms, uh, got angry, got in his car, and drove away. I never heard from him again. Uh, now this is you know an extreme example, obviously, but we run into this situation, Hal, and I know you know as a as a as a commercial guy. Size matters there too, right? Uh, what do you do when you've got you've got an appraiser doing doing one thing, and you've got agents out there you know for a fact don't know what they're doing, uh, bringing stuff to the MLS, bringing stuff to uh, uh, maybe it's a county assessor doesn't really understand how to measure. Or maybe they're measuring from a drone in the sky. Whatever. The problem is, is we've got apples to oranges, and yet that's what we're, what we're choosing as our as our comps. Yeah, I see. I see what you're getting at, and. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that. I, th I think from from an appraiser's perspective, I want to be uh, on the subject property. I want to be the guy who's right, just like you were in the situation you just you just described. I want to be the one who's right. I want to be able to prove how I came up with my measurements. I want to be able to say, here's the standard that I used, um, whatever the standard ends up being. I think ANSI is, is a fine way to approach it. Um, but the comparables, I don't know. I'm not going to go measure each one of the comparables. I'm not going to take the time to do that. I can't take the time to do that. Right, Probably right. can't get access to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, I think you 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 have to just think about it in terms of this is what the market is seeing. It's the information they're using to make their decisions. And I know that I've got the subject correct. I've verified this information with this agent and with this homeowner and this buyer. Um, they all agreed that it's 1600 square feet. If it turns out that it's not 1600 square feet, that's not on me. That's on yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, John, as we talk about standards, that's really the reason for the standard. I think that's uh, the point you were making in the beginning is, you know, if we're standing before a judge, we're standing before some state board somewhere uh, and uh, and we've got a realtor saying that it's 1600 and we've got ourselves saying that it's 1200 uh, and the judge looks at us and says, you know, w how did you measure it? And, and we can verify that we measured it using ANSI standards. And then he turns to the realtor and says, well, what standard did you use? And he, and he goes back to Hal's example. Well, that's the way my daddy taught me to measure. Um, it it, it uh, might bode well for our case. Right. And, and, and I think that's really why we're here talking about standards and the importance yeah. of standards. You know, Dustin, I would, I would, I would echo that. And then I would say two, two other things. One in response to that, it's not just about defense of your position with regards to maybe a regulatory agency or with a judge. But imagine you're off because the way you're handling a casita, a detached or attached unit, however, in, and you're not including it in the gross living area, but maybe mm -hmm. separating it into a different space. How awesome is it to when an agent like you're dealing with says, no, it's 1600 square foot because see this uh, um, additional living space above the garage, that's 400 square feet. Mm -hmm. But you can say, I, I appreciate that but I'm following and adhering to a standard. And this, this is how the standard requires that I measure the house. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can rely back on that. What I would also say, Dustin, is don't assume that the appraisers are the only ones. There are There's litigation and cases across the country that are also involving real estate agents. It's one of the reasons why North Carolina, as I said before, requires that they're agents. There's been cases in Texas and Oklahoma and in others. In Oklahoma, the the uh, real estate agent lost a suit because they should have known. They walked in the house, they knew the number represented by the county assessor was incorrect. Um, and they considered it to be reckless and harmless and an act of dishonesty. So real estate agents are facing some of the same issues that appraisers are. I would just rather be on the right side of it. And it starts with us. So let's measure the houses accurately. Good. Yeah. And John, you, uh, you've taught this class uh, on, on how to measure and you and I talked off the air. I, I found it interesting, the anecdotal stories you told me about uh, 
how appraisers often think they know what they're uh, doing and then they uh, jump into a classroom situation and realize that there's a whole lot that they don't know and i guess you know it's true with anything we don't know what we don't know until we know it right uh so let's let's talk about some of these standards let's talk first of all about measuring um measure from the outside walls right exterior walls exterior to exterior unless you you know you're starting at the garage it would be an exterior to what we call um to the paint okay so the the drywall what about the brick on the exterior? That's a that's a question that's a, often asked. Do you go to the inside the, of the brick or the outside? You're going to take the um, the nearest measurement. So it, it depends on if, if is that brick going all the way up the house or do you have brick and there's a, a little cantilever out mm -hmm. that you yeah. fill and then there's siding. You're going to go to the siding that's maybe two or three inches in. But yes, okay. exterior walls. Okay, so if it's a full brick, then uh, then 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 you're looking at uh, the exterior wall there. Yep. Uh, what about the rounding? This is a question that comes up uh, a lot, guys. Uh, you know, um, people say, "Well, I, I adhere to, to ANSI, and I measure to the nearest half foot." Is that a dichotomy? Yeah. <laughs> um, what is it? What is the what's the standard? ANSI standard is to the nearest tenth of an inch. Um, okay. If you can do an inch, that's great. I get appraisers that will say, you know, first of all, laser works great. I know you use one, Dustin. Um, yeah. The reality is how often are you at, you know, 10 foot or 10.4 feet or 10.7 feet? I mean, mm -hmm. the reality is contractors out there based on uh, materials alone are are really going to the, the nearest foot. Um, that's the way plywood set up, drywall and framing and everything else. Uh, so that's, so you're going to get that, but um, to the nearest tenth of an inch. Is that realistic? To do it that way? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the bottom line is, is you're never going to come up. It's never going to match. If you're doing it to the nearest tenth of an inch, I'm sorry, you're just never going to match. Yeah, I mean, for me, Dustin, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do a lot of things when I'm measuring a house. So I, I record my measurements front versus back, side versus side. Um, oftentimes, I'm a half a foot off somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's very possible that, you know, walls are not always plumb. Um, so it's very possible that I'm off somewhere. And if I change that or at least go remeasure one of the walls, that's usually where I find a difference and, and I can square the house up. I mean, the house should be square. Yeah. They're all, um, and I guess that's really the question here is, uh, okay, we, we quote ANSI. Should we leave a little bit of a, a leeway in there uh, where possible or you know, some, some kind of language that gives us a little bit of leeway? Because the bottom line is, is you can quote ANSI all the time and someone can go out there and measure to the nearest tenth of an inch, which you just mentioned is the, uh, is the standard. And they're going to say, no, 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 Dustin, you said ANSI, but uh, this wall is definitely 10.7 and you put it at 10.5. You know, I mean, it, when we're that close, Dustin, the differences are going to be minor. But you can imagine if you start rounding to the nearest half a foot or in some cases, appraisers do round to the nearest foot. Um, you know, a, a half a foot on a 50 foot long wall. Mm -hmm. That can make a big know, difference. You start doing that over and over again. You start. That's where the differences start coming in. And Dustin, Dustin you, you yeah. use a laser measure. Uh, I know John does as well. But, you know. I'm an old man and I grew up using the hundred foot tape every time. Um, and how many times have you stretched a tape across the front of a house and the house is, I don't know, 50, 60 feet long and that tape sags or it gets caught on a shrub or mm -hmm. it gets stuck on something and you can lose a 10th of an inch there easily. Yep. Yep. That's why we use uh, lasers, Hal. Right. We're, we're talking with Hal Humphreys and, uh, and John Dingman of Appraiser eLearning today. We're talking about ANSI standards, folks. Uh, speaking of standards, uh, how about getting standards in the way that you import your data? That means whatever is in the county, whatever is in the MLS goes directly into your software. That's what Data Master will do for you. Folks, I'll tell you, when they say it saves you 30 to 60 minutes per report, they're not kidding. I know because I do it all the time. I'm either going to have to do that myself or I'm going to have to hire that out tell you what, why don't you just have technology do it? Sure, you're going to double check it. Sure, you're going to make sure it's accurate. But whatever's in those standards, if you will, we're talking standards today, will go directly into your appraisal software. It's Data Master. Go to datamasterusa.com for more information. Find out if they're in your area. If they are, you should be using them and saving 30 to 60 minutes per report. Again, datamasterusa.com. We talked about appraisal software. The software you're going to want to import that into, of course, is All the Mode. All the Mode is the software I've been using for over two decades. They've been in business over three decades, helping appraisers to do more with less. That means working smarter, not harder. Let me 
tell you just a couple of things that I use on a regular basis. Users, the opportunity to split your, uh, your appraisal work into users so that you can have your own preferences, your own quick list, your own uh, uh, common, commonly used phrases, uh, your own signature, keeping uh, secure track of that. Folks, these things, they sound like minor things, but I could tell you hundreds of things that Alamo does that other software does not do. Check them out. Go to alamo.com. There's a reason that they are a leader in the appraisal industry. Uh, it's alamo.com or pick up the phone and call a sales rep at 800 Alamo. And finally, we are sponsored today by OREP Insurance. OREP is the insurance that I use. Why? Uh, just recently renewed my e &O, and uh, what a what a, a smooth process that was. I'll tell you, there was one, one part in that process where I was a little bit frustrated because I had sent off an email and I had not heard back. And so about two weeks, I sent a, an email off to Lori and I said, hey, Lori, um, I hate to bug you, but I really need to get on this. And she said, oh, I sent you an email on this date. And sure enough, it was, uh, it was there. It was on my side, not hers that I didn't get it. Uh, these folks are right on top of everything. They make it very, very smooth uh, to renew. Uh, they make it very inexpensive to renew and they cover appraisers when there comes uh, to be a problem. And there may be a problem. As we talk about standards today, you want to make sure that you're covered. OREP is the insurance that I use. It's OREP.org. For more information, it's OREP.org. And welcome back, folks. We are talking with uh, John Dingman and, uh, and, and Hal Humphreys. Welcome back, guys. Thank you, Dustin. We're talking uh, ANSI standards today. We're talking about how we measure a property and frequently asked questions that have come in. Uh, before we get into uh, more questions, so talk to us a little bit about what's out there, John, uh, with regard to uh, um, education. I know that e-learning has, uh, has a program out there. How You might want to speak to that. Uh, how, how can appraisers learn more about how to measure properly? So... I would start by this. There is a, there is a home measurement specialist certification that's available. Uh, that is through the uh, Housing uh, Institute of Housing Technologies. Um, you say size matters. It's really great. And I, I would tell you, Dustin, I found a book by Hamp Thomas, David Hamp, Th Hamp Thomas out of North Carolina. And it was called Size Matters. And I <laughs> love the book so much. It was about measuring and it's really just a book. Um, and I thought, well, God, I'm going to look for more stuff by this guy. And I found a book on how to measure a single family residential property. So I bought that and I called Hamp and I said, Hamp, this would make for a great textbook for a class. And he says, well, it is. It's an eight hour <laughs> class for appraisers and it's a okay. four hour class for real estate agents in the state of North Carolina. And I asked him if uh, the Coalition of Arizona Appraisers could use that class and if we could start teaching it in Arizona. We've done that. We've done it in California. So some of your state coalitions offer it live. Um, I know that uh, Appraiser eLearning off also offers it online. There are is that the same class, Hal? It is. Uh, and and the fun thing about the, the class online and Appraiser eLearning in general is we we try to include a lot of video content. Um, and if you've if you've never met Hamp Thomas. When you hear him speak, he's got this beautiful southern lilt to his voice, and he's 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 just he's engaging. And you you watch the videos, and you feel like you know the guy by the end of the thing. Um, it's a good course. Uh, it is the same course online as he presents in the live setting. Um, and I, I gotta say, we've gotten overwhelmingly good feedback from the appraisers who have taken. Uh, the course and from real estate agents who have taken the course. We've, we've been marketing to real estate agents in North Carolina and Tennessee over the past couple of weeks and people are really enjoying the course. Um, and again, I think for the professionals out there, they're looking for a standard. This is a good introduction to ANSI as a standard and how to measure things, what you include, what you don't include, how you deal with stairs, how you deal with, you know, basements, those things. Um, and again, it's it comes back to if you have a standard that is nationally recognized and you do get into um, a shouting match with uh, an agent who says it's 1600 square feet and you're like, no, it's 1200 square feet. Or you mm -hmm. find yourself on the stand in a court of law or in front of um, your, your regulatory agency, uh, you can go back and say, number one, I took this course. Number two, I have this book and it is a standard and here's how I did yeah. it. Yeah, and finally, good. Dustin, I, there is a second course that's required to get your home measurement specialist certification. You also have to take an exam. Before you take the exam, you take one of, one of you take both courses. The second course is on public records and the discrepancies that uh, you can find or that are involved. That is that course was updated specifically, uh, and it is online and it's only with appraisory learning. 
Okay, interesting. So, so just to be clear, John, if if an appraiser takes this course by Hamp, the 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 part one, does he teach the part two as well? He does. Hamp okay. teaches both courses, oh. and, and the process to get the HMS specialized um, certificate is you take home measurement, the ANSI standard course, which is the first one, and then you take the public records course, which which goes through. It can seem a little redundant at times, um, but it's it's a good primer on the ANSI standard, but it also discusses some things that we were talking about earlier, the discrepancies between MLS data, um, you know, your, your tax assessor data, those things, and the ANSI standard. Uh, and then once you've taken both of those courses, then you're allowed to sign up for and take the final exam from Hamp Thomas, and he issues a certificate as a home measurement specialist. I got gotcha. you. Okay, cool. And once, once you're certified, you're certified. It's not a, a thing you've got to renew every so often. I think that's right. Yeah, and I would assume most states, or some states maybe, um, would even count that as a continuing education. <clears throat> towards your, I believe they do, your yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So let's, let's talk standards. Let's talk some of these questions that have come in. Uh, one of the, one of the big uh, questions that come in is kind of a broad question, but uh, what can and cannot be counted as living area? Let's, let's deal with it on a, on a high level first, and then we'll dig into uh, as, as Hal brought up stairs and basements and different things like that. But in general, what can be counted as living space and, and, uh, and, and what should we avoid? So I'm going to, for the sake of it, uh, Dustin, I'm going to read so that it, so that we're clear on this because it's um, it's outlined in ANSI. So, okay. what can be included? It's an enclosed area in a house that is suitable for a year-round use, embodying walls, floors, and ceilings that are similar to the rest of the house. Sections of the house that do not meet the criteria of a finished area might be finished areas adjacent to an unfinished area, openings to below, uh, you know, to the floor below. Uh, above and below grade finished areas, finished areas connected to the house, garages, unfinished areas, or and or protrusions. Right. Okay. So, um, this sounds pretty standard. I mean, it sounds like like the like the way I was taught. Mm -hmm. I think one one thing that we run into is is these uh, words such as similar. Uh, it's similar to the rest of the house. Well, okay, sure, it's similar, but is it like unto? I don't know. You know, some some of those things have to be a judgment call on the appraiser side. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Room right. for some of that. Let's talk uh, second floor. Uh, you t you referred to John. You referred to open areas. Uh, I call them vaulted ceilings. Uh, open areas that uh, that might come. You know, there's a lot of individuals, especially when you talk to a builder. They think that should be counted as square footage. Uh, obviously, if you can't walk on it, you can't count it, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's talk uh, uh, second floor. One of the big questions is the sloping ceilings. A lot of times people will finish off their attic. Uh, you know, it wasn't designed uh, originally maybe to be living space, but uh, hey, we might as well have another floor up there. It's, it's, it's you know, I've po poked my head up there. It's nice and big and open. Let's finish it off. They finish it off. You've got these sloping ceilings on either side. Um, can you count those guys? Brian Reynolds tells a story of um, you know, the appraiser saying, well, you measure from where my shoulder hits the, the slope of the ceiling. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is if John is measuring the house, he's going to come <laughs> up with easy. more square footage than oh, I'm going to come up easy. with. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you guys stand next to each other. In other words, yeah. right? I'm vertically challenged. I get it. <laughs> I am too, John. So, so I've heard, I've heard five foot. Is that, is that just something I've heard or is there, there a standard there, John? No, it, it's five feet. So you're going to okay. go up five feet. There's ways to do this. So an appraiser has the opportunity within their sketching software. Usually you can go ahead and use the, the full building area. There may be some functional use there that the appraiser has to consider right, is with regards to contributory value. And then you can use dotted lines, for example, to show where your actual gross living area is. And that okay. should be at the five foot mark. That's easy enough to accomplish with a laser or even a tape measure. Okay, so is there something to do, and maybe I'm putting you on the spot here because uh, I, I didn't plan on this question, but it's something that, that comes up often uh, in these situations that let's say you've got in the middle of the room all the way down from one side to another, you've got a, maybe it's five foot, well, maybe it's six feet, okay? It's six feet in the tallest area, and let's say it's two feet wide, okay? You're envisioning this, it's, it's maybe 20 feet long, two feet wide, that's six foot, and then it immediately slopes down. Can I only count that two feet or does that allow me to, to now count some space uh, because you do have the minimum height, at least in the middle? Does that make sense? So that, so 
that is the height required, or that's where you would measure gross living area, Dustin. But you okay. need actually uh, a ceiling height of at least seven feet mm. um, to be included in in the finished square footage, and that is um, fifty percent of the room. Oh, least. interesting. Okay, man, there's a whole lot of houses. So, so this runs into this other uh, this other question that I uh, kind of alludes to the question that we talked about before the break, and that is, if you've got the standard, but then you've got the market, then you've got kind of a, a distinction there. In other words, it's very obvious that all my comparables are counting that that attic area up there, and and they're they're similar to my subject. Uh, I can't officially count it as gross living area yet. Yet the comps are being counted that way. I, you know, it does not, I would, again, go back to a case. I was, I think I was at a conference. I might've been even been at one with you. And I got a phone call from a student that had been through the measurement course. And she said, uh, Hey, I'm on break, by the way, I'm in a lawsuit. And the mm -hmm. lawsuit is about a difference in square footage only. And the difference comes from a slope ceiling. Mm -hmm. I measured at the five foot mark, the other appraiser measured to the wall. Mm -hmm. All right. And, um, she simply pointed. She followed a standard. Um, yeah, yeah, prevail. yeah. Well, he think, he, he did think, it like his daddy taught him, right? Now, yeah, like like, like my dad had taught me. Um, <laughs> I, Dustin, I think that the question that you're asking about um, if if all of the comparables have that same um, attic area that's been finished and they're selling it based on that square footage, I think maybe there are probably a number of ways you could address that, but. John mentioned earlier that the idea of contributory value, mm -hmm. it may not be actual um, living area, but it has some value. And there, as an appraiser, you don't have to just like, it's got this many square feet and that's all I'm going to give you credit for. Right, uh, right, right. I'm going to ignore that because it's, it's, it's six foot, uh, 10 inches. Right. I mean, there's some value there, uh, especially if the market sees that. So, um, I think you maybe address that as a contributory value issue yeah. and say, you know, the market says, you know, the sales indicate this many square feet. They're including this in their square footage calculations. My standard says I can't do that, but I'm going to give this uh, some, you know, some amount of value as contributory value. Mm -hmm. Good. Love it. Okay. Let's talk basements. What can and can't be counted, guys? <clears throat> Dirt floor, not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, Dustin, the, Fannie and, and, and HUD both have in the selling guideline in the handbook, they have their definition of what's below grade and above grade. Um, remember, it's the, the point here is gross living area. Gross living area is above grade, right? right? Defined as above grade. Below grade is below grade. There are instances and Fannie and Freddie uh, and, and HUD ad, admit that there are going to be instances where the house literally has very little square footage, if any, because the living area is, uh, is below grade. Mm -hmm. um, all, all it has to have is dirt on one of the four walls. Mm -hmm. And that, that entire level would be considered below grade. Yeah, I grew the, up the in Michigan. The hundred percent, right, John? hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. My, um, my uncle, I grew up in Michigan. My uncle lived on a lake, uh, you know, from the street level, you pulled into a garage and in there you walked into a utility room. There was a half bath and there was like a bonus room. Right. I mean, that was the above grade. That was the GLA. You walk downstairs is where the kitchen was right out on the water, uh, the bedrooms, the 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 main bath and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, for his house, he had about 400 square feet. OK. All right. Uh, say again. Gross, G living, gross area. living area. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, let's talk uh, fireplaces. I'm, I measure around the outside. I come to a little bump out uh, at, at first. It looks like a, a little cantilever. Um, but then I realize, no, this is a chimney. Uh, it's on the outside of the house, obviously running up the side. Uh, do I count that? Do I run past that and pretend it's not there? Um, how, do, how do fireplaces work, guys? No, you don't count it. Um, okay. You know, on my sketches, I show where it is. I might even mm -hmm. show the actual measurement just for the, you know, I'm a little OCD with my sketches, Dustin, but. Um, no, you're not putting it, cars in the garage, are you, John? I've seen appraisers do that. <laughs> they, they put the um, little toilets. They put occasionally the I might, but no, I mean, but I will put where the fireplaces are. I think it, okay. it's a good reminder for me also to make sure that my, you know, the page one in the grid is, is reflecting the same information that's in the sketch. So, um, okay. but you do not 
you do not count the bump out for that. You would count bump outs for things like Bay areas where you have floor mm -hmm. space. You mm -hmm. would not count, sure. you know, a Bay window where it's a, a garden window, right? It's yeah. from yeah. maybe. Right. Cause you can't stand on it and, and fireplace is the same. Well, I guess unless you're Harry Potter, you're not going to stand in the fireplace, Correct. right? Okay. Stairs. That's always the big, big question. Uh, stairs. How do you count stairs? You've got a stairway coming down. Let's say it's from uh, level one going up to level two. Uh, how do you count stairs for GLA? That square footage belongs somewhere. Um, there are differences in the standards. ANSI says, it, so here I'm Dustin, this is where most appraisers get caught up when they're in the class. They follow ANSI to a T until they figure out they're removing the, the, the stairwell from one of the levels. Mm -hmm. That would be American measurement standards. So that's mm -hmm. really okay. the only difference. ANSI includes the staircase on both. Hamp likes to talk about uh, an accordion. So think of it as somewhat yeah. of an accordion. So the stairs go up, right? Now right. that's you can walk right on those. Obviously, uh -huh. the first floor. Now the stairs are up. You have floor surface there. Maybe right. there's closets or something else, or a half bath or something. But but it's still a usable area. Other than that last that last little uh, uh, stairway, there's a stair there. You're you you've got usable area. Yep. And you know, look. If again, we can we go back to the differences. You may find out that the difference is very simply. The county assessor is using exterior measurements only. They haven't removed any open to below areas or staircases or anything like that. Um, that may be the case. They may have. And for some appraisers, this is, well, every house, they remove the staircase from the upper level. Now you want me to follow ANSI where I don't remove it from either. Well, it's from a finished level. Um, again, if the staircase is 40 or 80 square feet, then you can make the assumption or extraordinary assumption that the builder has reported the square footage to the county assessor the same for every house mm. and therefore the difference of you know 80 square feet um you know you're extending your uh, adjustment well beyond that mm -hmm. okay and, and the bottom line is i mean if you're gonna for the ground floor use exterior measurements on a standard house you use exterior measurements to get your square footage for the ground floor you don't take out closets you don't take out the utility room. Those are considered sure. square footage in that floor. Um, the, the space underneath the stairs is usable. It's a floor area. It's finished. It's there. Um, but those stairs service the second floor. So I think the ANSI standard basically says those stairs are square footage going up to the second floor and should be included therein. The, the difference between that and, say, a lofted area is if you've got a loft and a vaulted ceiling that goes up two stories, there's no usable square footage underneath that vaulted spot. Stairs, you've got usable square footage going up at the second floor. Well, John, I, I, I think I understand why this is such a popular class with appraisers. I, I'm, I'm already, you know, primed with about a thousand other questions that I would love to, to, to ask. Unfortunately, our, our time is short, but are there any other questions, frequently asked questions, John, that you, as you've taught this class, um, you think would be uh, would be helpful for us to hit on before we wrap things up today? You know, I I don't know if there's anything specific. There's there's usually a lot, and I'll share the same story with everybody that I shared with you uh, on the on the phone the other day. It's a seven hour class most of the time, at least live. In some states, it's eight hours. And when I'm standing at the front door, um, you know me, and I'm greeting folks as they come in. I usually get two or three folks that say, "Hey." Um, I'm here, man. I paid for the seven hours. This better be good, but I don't know what you're going to tell me after the first hour that mm -hmm. I don't already know. Right. And I would also say when I'm teaching courses that are seven hours, usually at about the five hour mark or the six hour mark, people are just like, ah, when are we going to be done? Can we be done early? Can, I, can we take a shorter lunch? Whatever. I'll give people the short lunch. Um, and it'll be the seventh hour and I'm telling the students, hey, you guys, you guys are ready to go. And most all of the time, I'm still there and either the conference center or the hotel is saying, hey, you guys are, your time is up and you need to get out of the room. <laughs> and it's because people start coming up with other questions and yeah. scenarios and what do I do about- It's not the scenario? donuts and the, and the coffee at the back of the room? Accessory dwelling units are a big deal. And when mm -hmm. do we come, when do we, when don't we, where should we give it contributory value and all of those kinds of things. But I think people genuinely start to realize 
that, hey, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Um, and this could really help me in, in my practice. And for others, they just go, oh, my God. Uh, I'm just going to keep doing what my daddy taught me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is too much. Hey, yeah, I'll tell you, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm dead serious when I say this. I'm, I'm actually excited about taking a class. I, I think, I think I'm going to do it. I, I, I've already learned things that I didn't know. Uh, it's already brought up all kinds of questions that I have. And uh, here I've been doing this 24 years, and I've never taken a class. Never taken a class. I'm going to admit it right here on the air. In front of thousands of appraisers, I've never actually taken a class on measurement standards. So, Hal, if I wanted to take the class from uh, Appraiser eLearning, what would I do? Uh, you simply type into your uh, Google URL bar up there, uh, appraiserelearning.com. Uh, and I think it's one of the first courses that pops up. If it's not, you just search around for the ANSI standard course. Um, there's also the public records course. And I want to I want to make something really clear because, again, we've gotten really good feedback on these courses. Um, there is some overlap between the ANSI standard course and the public records course. So it's designed that way because a lot of people don't take them one right after the other. Some people take one one year, the other the next year. Hmm. But the important thing to remember is once you take those two classes, then you have to apply for and take the final exam, which is where the rubber hits the road. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where you kind of get your head around you know, the ANSI standards and how to apply them. Uh, after you get that done, then you can get your HMS certificate. Uh, so it's not just a matter of taking the two classes. You have to take two classes and then do the uh, exam afterwards, uh, this kind of a comprehensive exam. But again, it's uh, appraiserelearning.com. Um, and we've, we've got a number of other classes there, but we're talking about ANSI today and it's, I'm, I'm proud of it. I think HAMP has done a fantastic job. Uh, the, the, the entire office staff here at, at, at Appraisery Learning, we're all in love with HAMP. He's, he's fantastic. And you'll, if you take, it sounds like a little bit of a man crush going on there, Hal. A little bit, just a hint. Just you a hint. watch it, Dustin, and I, I'll call you and tell me if you don't have the same man crush. I love it. I love it. Hal Humphreys and uh, John Dingman, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great being uh, a part of this uh, uh, kind of a joint effort today with uh, Appraiser eLearning and the Appraiser Coach Podcast. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, look forward to uh, to talking to you and uh, rubbing shoulders with you soon. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Dustin. Dustin. Thank you so All much. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye now. All right, folks, you've been listening.